Hello everyone, I'm Margaret Leinen. I'm the Director of Scripps Institution of Oceanography and the Vice Chancellor for Marine Science at the University of California, San Diego. It's a pleasure to welcome you to a special video presentation of the 2021 Nuremberg Prize for Science in the Public Interest. This is a special video presentation as a result of COVID. Previous recipients of the Nuremberg Prize for Science in the Public Interest have included Gordon Moore, David Attenborough, Jane Goodall, E.O. Wilson, James Cameron, and Jennifer Doudna, who recently won the Nobel Prize. Today, we're honoring Dr. Warren Washington. Dr. Washington is a climate scientist but he specializes in climate modeling, the mathematical models that combine climate, ocean, and atmosphere in one big model that allows us to look forward in time and understand the impacts of our fossil fuel emissions and other anthropogenic effects on our climate. He pioneered this area and developed many innovations in climate science and in climate modeling. Dr. Washington's climate models have been used extensively by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the UN body that assesses our climate every few years. And his work has really given us a much sharper understanding of what we'll be living with in the future. Dr. Washington's work has been recognized by many previous prizes. He's a member of the National Academy of Engineering, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the Philosophical Society. He's received prizes from the American Meteorological Society, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He's been honored with the National Medal of Science and with the Tyler Prize. Dr. Washington's entire career has highlighted the importance of communicating about climate science as well as doing climate science. And he has led the way in mentoring new generations of scientists, including especially those from underrepresented groups. And now I'd like to welcome Bill Nuremberg's son, Nicholas Nuremberg, to join me in presenting the 2021 Nuremberg Prize for Science and the Public Interest to Dr. Warren Washington. The Nuremberg Prize is presented annually in the memory of my father, William Nuremberg. He was born to immigrant parents in 1919 in New York City and received his PhD from Columbia University in 1947 after working on the Manhattan Project during the war. He was a professor of physics at UC Berkeley for 20 years, where he published over 100 papers on low energy physics. In 1965, he was appointed director of Scripps, where he became its longest serving director. During his tenure, the budget of the institution increased fivefold and many important research programs, such as the Deep Sea Drilling Project, were initiated. Never one to be told no, he also famously maintained the funding for Charles Keeling's CO2 research over the resistance to the Reagan administration. He chaired committees for the Department of Defense, NOAA, the Department of Energy, and the National Academy of Sciences. The National Academy, this included chairing the productions of the first comprehensive reports on both climate change and acid rain. Science and the public interest was his great passion, and so it's fitting that a prize in his name is given for exceptional contributions. I want to thank the Selection Committee of Scripps Oceanography for the outstanding choice of this year's prize winner, Warren Washington. Dr. Washington is a pioneer and visionary in computer-based simulation of the atmosphere. His work spanned decades and not only inspired current generations of climate simulations, but many programs developed by his team are still in use today. With the growing importance of climate change, atmospheric simulation has become one of our most key technologies. Of course, Dr. Washington has gone far beyond his scientific work to promote science and science communications. Eventually, he became the chief scientist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, our country's central agency for studying weather and climate. In addition, he has served on numerous federal boards and agencies, including the National Science Board, NOAA, and he served as an advisor to every president from Ronald Reagan to Barack Obama. In addition, Dr. Washington has worked hard to promote diversity in science and particularly in atmospheric science. Recently, these efforts have paid off with a rapidly growing diverse community moving through the educational system and into leadership roles. Congratulations to Dr. Washington as the recipient of the 2021 Nuremberg Prize for Science in the Public Interest. 
Thank you, Nico. COVID upset the timing for our prize and also the ability to travel. So today we have this special video interview of Dr. Warren Washington. And he's going to be interviewed by another distinguished atmospheric scientist, Dr. Vernon Morris. Dr. Morris is a person that Warren mentored throughout his career. Dr. Morris was the department chair in atmospheric science at Howard University. And while there, he developed the NOAA Cooperative Science Center in atmospheric science and meteorology. Dr. Morris's work on trace gases and aer aerosols in urban environments has led him to receive many prizes and awards as well. Dr. Morris is now the Dean of the School of Mathematical and Natural Sciences at the new Interdisciplinary College of Arts and Sciences at Arizona State University. And now joining me is Mr. Nicholas Nuremberg, son of Dr. William Nuremberg. Nicholas is here on behalf of the Nuremberg family to join with Scripps Oceanography to present the Nuremberg Prize for Science in the Public Interest to Dr. Warren Washington. I just want to say how pleased we are to be presenting this prize to Dr. Washington today. Dr. Washington, would you accept the prize, please? Well, uh, good afternoon, Warren. It's good to see you. It's been a little while. Uh, and it's an honor, actually, for me, I must say, to, to be giving this uh, interview, having this conversation uh, as part of the Nuremberg uh, ceremony. Um, I put together uh, a list of questions that I'll go through um, that range from your early influences uh, and pathways into science uh, to early climate model development, uh, to your service on the national stage in terms of um, emerging science and policy and how science can influence policy and policymakers, uh, to the effects of climate change and advocacy, uh, to some of the current grand challenges, and then finally wrap it up with uh, a perspective. So looking back on your career and looking forward at the next generations of scholars in climate science and some of your thoughts on that and advice to those. So we'll start off, uh, we're just finishing the Juneteenth celebrations uh, across the nation. It's become a national holiday um, and stems from uh, a historical event that actually started a migration, a westward migration for a lot of African Americans. And I know you, uh, some of your relatives grew up in the West. I'm wondering um, what are your thoughts on that, and, and how does your family history connect to uh, the Westwood migration? How did your ancestors come out to the West? Well, uh, <clears throat> that's an interesting point. Uh, on my mother's side, there was a family of, of 12 children, and in, in, in 1904, there was something called the Lewis and Clark Expedition in Portland, Oregon. And he came out and thought it was great to be in Oregon, hot Texas. <laughs> and, and one relative after another came, and, and they all ended up in Portland, Oregon. Went to the same church and so forth and so on. In fact, that was the church I grew up in. Uh, the interesting thing is that there, there was a high degree of graduation from, from uh, uh, you know, graduation and getting two degrees into being professional people, which I think affected me directly because. My mean, grandpa would say, what are you going to do with yourself? <laughs> Many times. <Yeah. laughs> it turned out that I got interested in science. And that was just an accident in some ways, or a series of accidents. Um, 
my, I had some in high school a very uh, excellent chemistry teacher who would, would answer questions by saying, why don't you figure that out? And one of them was, why are egg yolks yellow? And, and, and it turned out that she required us all to have a handbook of chemistry, which you certainly knew about. And, and we looked it up and turned out that it's due to the color comes from different species of, of, of food. Most of it was wheat grain. So some grains had more pigment and the other ones had, had less pigment. So I answered that question that one. But she was great at doing that, and it was fun. I know what I'm saying. And then in my senior year of high school, I got an opportunity to learn about physics. And physics was a turn on, too. So I was always very curious about how things worked. And uh, it, it, it turns out that I had had a simple job washing dishes in high school in a, in a big hospital. And I asked the um, uh, dietitian, where should I go for undergraduate? And she said, Oregon State, they have a strong physics program. So I, I went there. And physics won out over chemistry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. You know why I asked that question. Well, well so what, what was it about, your, it sounds like the teacher with the greatest influence was a chemistry teacher. Yeah. But you still selected physics. Why? Well, it turned out that the physics teacher was very uh, good also. I mean, they were both very good teachers in many ways. But I was turned on by... science in general and how things work. And my mother encouraged me by allowing me to get a, 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 a library card when I was even in, in eighth grade, from seventh or eighth, eighth grade. So I spent many hours just asking the question, how did these people become scientists of the various types? And it turned out that they uh, all had ordinary family situations, just like I did, with very so, so, so supportive parents and encouraging. So I ended up going to Oregon State. Then another opportunity came when I was working on my master's. Uh, the people at Stanford were starting to put together a computer model of the atmosphere. And they were looking for students. And uh, was one of them. And how did they get to, how did they find you at Oregon State? Was that a special program or? Well, Oregon State had, a, had a, a meteorologist who served in World War II. And he, he, he was always trying to encourage people to get into a meteorology. And I thought that was exciting too, because even before I graduated, uh, people were after me to come uh, work in different cities. So uh, in, in the early 
1960s, there were about five graduate schools out teaching meteorology for PhD. And uh, interesting that uh, I think there were 12 PhDs graduated in meteorology in 1963. So you know, it was a field that was starting to open up and they were anxious to get students and, and faculty members. Um, but only 10 students a year for PhDs was pretty small. If you um, compare it to over well, well, 100 schools now, are offering PhDs in that field. Uh, you well, yeah, I, the question I've always had was you sort of tracked into, into physics, into meteorology, into climate models with a, what seems like a really well-defined path. But I always wonder when I see someone well-established, what was the other possible career path that got turned off? You know, was it meteorology or concert piano or meteorology or political science? Was What was the other career that could have been Warren Washington's career if it had not been? <laughs> That's a great question. I've never, <laughs> never thought about that. I, I've always been the meteorology right from the start. Yeah, I always had an interest in clouds and other aspects of meteorology. And it looks like an exciting area. And I, I was blessed with an extraordinary uh, thesis advisor. And it was His name was Hans Konotsky. He had a brother who uh, was also a scientist. Hans got his PhD when he was 21. And his, his brother, I think, at 18. Wow. And uh, he was great. Hans was a great. Uh, scientist. His father was a good friend of Einstein, and Einstein got him to come over to, to Princeton at the start of the World War. And uh, he kind of encouraged me to do whatever I wanted to do, and he would help me do it. And it turned out I picked up some very difficult areas in, in meteorology, the, the, the theory of how storms are formed, things like that, mathematical aspects of it. Uh, it was a scientific challenge to build a, com a computer model of the atmosphere. And he had some thoughts on that, and I had thoughts on it. And, and we visited to all of the places that were starting to get started in, in climate change and modeling of climate. That takes us into the early climate models and mm -hmm. just the development from early uh, models. And you talked a little bit about the challenges there, the constraints that were just being figured out, the limitations of the uh, computers. What were how did your scientific goals evolve as the computers evolved from grad school to postgraduate? Okay, it actually went a little bit after that. Uh, I, I got my, I was supposed to get my PhD in 1963, 64, excuse me. And I, I went to a meeting in, uh, Canada, and there were all of the experts on various aspects of climate. And I, I asked them if they would have drinks with me. <laughs> and we went to a, a, 
of a pub right on the border of of Canada and, and uh, uh, and, and, and the U.S. And uh, I asked myself, where well, should I, I, I go on a, on this? I see ready for type uh, and, and a computer type. They said, come to any car. And I, um, I, I wrote a letter and letter came back. Uh, offer of $90,000 a year. <laughs> was it nine with okay. three zeros, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> nine thousand. I took that job, okay. but I got offers from other schools that were beginning to enhance their 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 meteorological programs. But NCAR was ideal because it was on its roads, getting bigger computers and building and, and, and doing things. That are beyond the, the scale of, uh, of a single university program because it has everyone, everyone realized you had to have in, interactions with a large number of people who have two different skills in order to uh, uh, make progress in this field. And what were the, where were some of the other places? Um, was, was Boulder a, a geographic draw? Was it something? Was it the science that brought you to Boulder, or was it the science and something else? Or? There were there were other, other groups that were getting started too, and this seemed to be the most practical. And they had another scientist here. His name. Uh, Kura Fasahara. He is a, a scientist from Japan. And it had a, a series of strong Japanese people who were more in the theory of, on the on the and anti theoretical fields. And he was the father of of the other of the thing who I follow and I was hired to, to work for to work with him and it was a blessing he was he had to work for an excellent scientist at NYU uh, on this, on these types of problems. So um, we came and we were encouraged to Build it into a big program, and I think our, our models here at NCAR have been made available to academic scientists, Japanese, Chinese, other other people have adopted our models, and we've made in every three or four years a new version of the models. That it gets better and better with with time. So, well, what were some of the early models' greatest challenges? If you maybe went decade by decade, if you looked at the. Well, first of all, there was something called Fortran. <laughs> I know Fortran. <laughs> everyone, everyone knows something about Fortran or C or whatever it's called these days. By the time I started getting used to in way back in the mid seven in, in the mid sixties uh, was difficult because you had to had to do you know tell the, the computer to do something very simple like take a, a number out of the out of the storage area, we'll put it into something that's, that's called a register and then multiply it by another and multiply. And everything, you know, 
programming was so tedious that the phone was errors. And computers that broke down all the time just were, they had to be very patient. And when Fortran came along, it transformed us into doing things in a much simpler way. In a, in a, in a way that translates what's in the equation into a formula. And you, just, you, know, you could do all kinds of things. And uh, I think that uh, if we didn't have some of, the, some of these languages, um, we wouldn't have had made the progress that we made. Oh. So part of it, so it sounds like early, it was more technological challenge, just the translation of mathematics into a programming language that could mm -hmm. then be utilized easily. But what about the physics? What were the, the biggest physical challenges in the early models? Uh, some of the challenges now, which might possibly be non-physical, incorporating the human element. No, I think uh, we learned to overcome a lot of uh, well, short things in our knowledge. For example, Humorous clouds, these are the puffy clouds that you see, uh, which uh, I mean, some of them go into uh, forming, you know, th uh, thunderstorms and tornadoes and so forth. And trying to put some of these subscale, smaller features, but very important features in transporting heat. And it, it required inventing different ways of treating clouds, treating thunderstorms, and or, or how uh, jet stream shifts its position. All of these things involved improve understanding of, of the fundamentals of interactions of it in between uh, interactions in between having other storms in some scales and not in others. And this also throws up an oceanography too. Uh, we, we, we learn by having high resolution models, we can do a pretty good simulation of atmospheric motions with ocean measurements, sea ice forming and, and, and melting. And, and we're getting into uh, hooking into new models, things like uh, corals, coral reefs, how do they work? Our, glaciers, how they're starting to, to work. So we started out simple, and it's gotten more complex. But that's a, to, to, to be expected. I think so. I, I think it's a, a beautiful experiment in interdisciplinarity to model climate in ways that a lot of other fields were not bringing so many concept together, so many complexities together, the different expertise at that time. So what was that like? You know, early on you get to work with oceanographers and meteorologists and glaciologists and computer scientists and pure mathematicians. It was a different way of bringing people together. Academy, which said math is over here, physics is over there. Yeah. They're over there somewhere else. Well, the, well, the science keeps going, and I, I, I think that uh, that for us who, who were around early sixties, uh, um, we had to had to work with our colleagues, but not take away from the importance of their subjects, but to work with them. 
for example, uh, the early 60s and, and earlier, our, all of our models were small models with uh, just the U.S. And we, 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 we all knew that we have to have to go to global models. Well, it turned out uh, I had, a, had, had many students around me, but I found out that we didn't have a map of the temperatures of the globe. Most of oceanographers at that time studied Indian Ocean or Pacific and so forth. And if you put those all two together, you would have big interactions right happening at the borders of these different oceans. So I worked with a student and and we because we were wanted to have, have one of the first ocean and atmospheric models. And when we we mapped to those regional maps onto uh, to a global map, and we had to digitize that. And that single thing was my colleagues at other institutions would, would call me up and say, Warren, we understand that you generated the world map of ocean temperatures, surface ocean temperatures. We, 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 we never had that. I said, well, I sat down with a bunch of people who were experts in each of these ocean areas and generated the first map that had digital numbers for it so that you could use that to compare with the simulations. And uh, kind of funny, all of us who were in this area and at, at well, Scripps, Oshkia, uh, Woods Hole, and other oceanographic uh, people came and, and met with us many times. And we, we really learned by having specialists from the, some of the schools and institutions like Scripps who would spend a few months coming in, in the summer with us and things like that. And the National Center only told that had the responsibility of interacting with other institutions. And, and that has grown and, and been encouraged in our field because this is for well, you need a specialist, but you need also be somebody that that interacts with other other uh, more de sort of more detailed aspects of climate and 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 and, and, and weather. I, I feel I was fortunate to see that transition, and it still is taking place. It seems like you're formative in, in helping that transition along. Um, another transition, I think it was alluded to a little bit earlier, um, is science and policy. And you spent a number of years advising non-scientists and introducing uh, science on different scales to non-scientists. And at the national level, I think it was a historical moment that you were the first African-American uh, to get the National Medal of Science from the first African-American president. That's a unique yeah, a, uh, moment. Yeah. But how did the national vision of science evolve over the years? That you wow. <laughs> <laughs> you can't put it just a little bit broader. broader stuff, right? I got a call when, when Carter was president to be on something called the COLA. It was the Atlas, yeah, a presidential 
uh, committee of, of, of atmosphere and oceans. And I, I think, I think Nuremberg was also on a uh, heavy person that, that was at that. Well, it was, it was my first sort of dipping into things that were quite different. Uh, this could be a, a funny example. Uh, Congress was getting ready to, to I'll pass a law and all of the radar research would, would be would, would be challenged, uh, open to uh, explaining radar maps of the precipitation. Well, the company that was making that wanted to have it all turned over to the private sector. I was putting out, I was contacted by people and saying, well, it's fine to have the country do this, but you're going to have, everybody has to, have, has to pay the, the private sector for, for weather information. It, it should be open and free among farmers, but anybody. And the technology of doing that was really supported by various scientific programs and, and, and National Science Foundation, NOAA, other ones. Well, I was asked to help keep that from happening. Uh, it's, it's kind of a funny story. On the, uh, I'm in Congress there, and, and sitting next to the head of NOAA, or the no head of Congress. And the, the congressman for the, for, the, for the part that deals with, deals with science said to the head of, head of Congress, I understand that you have somebody in your staff who's going to benefit financially from this. And Dr. Washington is saying everybody should have these free. And, and then this congressman, who was chair of the committee, said, is it really true I have a letter here and, and your deputy is going to make be the president of this new company that would take over weather information. And the Congress isn't happy about that. Turns around and he said, what are you going to do about it? And, and this, the our Secretary of Commerce turned around and said, you're fired. <laughs> Turns back to the congressman and the chair of the committee. I think we've taken care of that problem. <laughs> It'll be, and the data will be available to any American who wants to have it. And which I was considered a hero for some of my colleagues because <laughs> I had done that. Well, I, over the years, my reputation grew not only from science, but I knew to do science. I think Margaret knows that I was affected uh, to the, to the uh, National Journal on the National Science Board. And I spent many years on that, and I was here for four years. In fact, uh, just as an example of interaction, the uh, Margaret Thatcher, uh, who is Prime Minister, uh, called us up here at NPAR. She was on her, on her way to 
Aspen, Colorado, to uh, speak with, with Ronald Reagan. And she, she, she wanted to uh, uh, um, briefing as to how serious climate change was. It's kind of a funny thing on the, on, on the governor of the state wanted to come to this meeting. And I'm, I'm very happy to find out that we worked out the thing where he could not answer, ask questions. And he could, but he, and what was interesting about that is he came, our, 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 I should say, she, she came and asked a whole bunch of questions. I, I, looked, I had put together a small group of scientists in all of the major areas. And we had the meeting in one here. And Margaret Thatcher yes, had gotten, I didn't realize this until we looked up her background. She had a scientific background in or 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 panic chemistry. And uh, asking the right questions. Same and it was a good meeting. And her uh, science advisor stood up and said, Well it's time for us to go and fly up to Aspen. And and she said, We're not going anywhere until I see every one of those slides you have on the <laughs> sat down. <laughs> <laughs> and so I uh, I had a good time with her. And she 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 wrote a really nice letter of thanking me and and our, our scientists for helping educate herself. But I think this is part of the, what I've always felt since those early days, is that we have a commitment to you know, help policymakers and the public that science is important and it's worth investing in and making better so we can have science, science, uh, issues thought out in in helping make things work as uh, they have to have to work if they don't work and we just make decisions on on non scientific grounds it's going to hurt everybody and internationally too. Thanks. That's, I had not heard that um, story. I had heard the story with John Sununu. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if you want to share that one. <laughs> you want me to comment on that? <laughs> I, I like that story. We'll, we'll come back to that. We'll come back okay. because I think there's a, you've touched, you know, sort of gone into the next section, and that is sort of public engagement. Um, science has, uh, I think the, reputation of science and scientists has gone through a rough patch, if I'll say it diplomatically over the last years. Public trust of science has taken a little bit of a hit. So, you know, at a time when climate change impacts are quite evident, uh, I think well received scientifically, how do you say that public interest in climate change has changed over that time. And what might climate scientists do to ensure that the public understands the best climate science that's out there? Yeah, well, uh, I think that well, uh, I think in our and in other, in other institutions have uh, have always felt a responsibility to help educate the, the public 
if I could first mention the uh, exhibits you saw how uh, you walked in. Um, we would normally have hundreds of kids learning about kids, learning different levels of, of science and meteorology. And uh, it's quiet now because we can't have those things yet. It was unfortunate. But, but, but I think NCAR probably bends over harder than most places we can. And there's an obligation to help make better policy and a better knowledge. Uh, Oh, that if, if you look at even any college or, or, or university, I find is that this subject has a lot of public interest. And uh, the people who, who uh, broadcast television or have certain shows about it, but also try to make it more and more understandable. And, and that has over the years helped attract more and more people into the geosciences. And uh, I think that's is unneeded. If we look at the real progress that's been made from the World War II to, to, to now, we made great progress. And, and, the information we have given to the states and to cities and, and people in general has saved lives. And, uh, and, and that's getting better and better. So speaking of that, I mean, the public good is certainly one of the premium goals, I think climate science. Um, your climate models have been used extensively uh, 2007 IPCC assessment, which ultimately won the prize. Um, I think that um, that Nobel Prize, I think, elevated climate science and climate scientists uh, in global high uh, experts. Um, but in the theme of public interest, what have you found to be the most impactful in speaking and educating people and leaders about climate change? I think the, the most impactful way I, I, I do it, I give talks to, and for the public and so forth. I believe in, in explaining the history. And, and now we're at a situation where we can compare the data that comes out of our models with the observed data. And, and it's been very important that we keep balancing our models. Are we getting El Ninos as, as, as much as they should be? Or are we getting too many uh, El Ninos in our models? We're, we're constantly comparing the data that comes out of these simulations and it is that over the years, things improve in our models. And uh, now uh, we can make a three or four day forecast very well. When we get out to two or three weeks or maybe one or two months or a season ahead, ahead, and we still find that there's things missing that we haven't included in our models, or included in them as accurately as we would like to do it soon. But even so, uh, having adequate data, having supercomputers using them intelligently uh, has been a has paid off not only our country, 
but many countries of the world who benefit from our our our, our forecast. And that that brings up an issue that I've always been pushing for is bringing visitors in as much as we can. A certain percentage of them uh, are are from uh, you know countries that have good problems. I mean, good good, good scientists, and we can benefit from that. But at the same time, also making the universities and colleges stronger in this area. And uh, I think uh, I think in the mid seventies, I usually took off several weeks to, a year to trope around to my own my own institutions. And giving talks and and, and certainly one of those people probably on the doorstep. No, <laughs> I was on the doorstep, but we let you in. It was not... <laughs> yeah. but I gave talks there. And, oh, absolutely, absolutely. And I, I talked to uh, you know, Vernon had one of the most vigorous programs for underserved minorities. And uh, I think that's helped to increase the, the population of people in this field. Well, it, it, it started much earlier. Um, probably remember the pioneers in atmospheric sciences uh, meeting at challenge that there weren't there was an interest in uh, representing communities in atmospheric sciences. And I think, you know, Charlie Anderson was the first uh, African American to get a PhD in meteorology. You were the second. Um, by my limited count, I think Craig and I were around eight and nine, uh, but now it's approaching 70 or so. Um, sort of a surge in the last decade or so. Um, you played a huge role in that um, from some of the older, gray-haired uh, <laughs> PhD atmospheric scientists to some of the, the, the ones just coming in with the programs, graduate school program. How do you, um, why do you think it's important for Geoscience and climate science exclusive and increase access to careers for diverse um, Well, I, I just think it's important in general because uh, we have the same sort of shortages in other, other um, groups of, of people, Spanish, Native American. Uh, and I think that uh, an obligation to make sure that we had reasonable participation of of of, of, of uh, minorities in in all areas of science, and uh, and they shouldn't just be. Uh, a few, a few in number, but enough to make room for more home. Uh, important society. If we have people who represent all all backgrounds and come in from other backgrounds, and that seems to be much better than it was say uh, ten years ago or, or twenty or thirty years ago. Oh, absolutely, I think absolutely. And you, as I said, you served as a role model um, for I think a number of the generations uh, coming in. Uh, mentored a number of individuals over the years, myself included. Um, what have been some of the biggest obstacles you faced, um, and what would you like to see 
in institutions like Scripps uh, Oceanography uh, to lessen these obstacles for reverse scientists. Yeah, I think I think that they still need the fundamentals in what area they picked out. For example, if you were going to be interested in clouds or or thunderstorms or tornadoes, you got to know some physics, chemistry, and and and, and, and biology in some ways. Uh, so so these these disciplines uh, still need to have fundamental knowledge as part of their curriculum. It's just the nature of the of the problem. And uh, I think that, that we are making progress. Uh, I'm just thinking of, of uh, the, the parallels between oceanography and atmospheric science. I think is I think pretty much under, understood now. Uh, interesting that when we first started building computer models. They were mostly just atmospheric models, not ocean. Oceans came a few years later by uh, uh, in, in trying to understand how the, the general circulation of the atmosphere works. Is, is you have to have. interaction in between the various elements. And, and I think that we know where those areas are. And, and there's still research opportunities. And, and several agencies, NSF, NOAA, NASA, and all of these other agencies have an understanding that, that they need to know how to do things at the boundaries of all of these, these areas in order to fully understand how, how climate changes and what causes uh, it's not, you know, a lot has happened in my lifetime and I could see it still going on. If you were to Look back, and I'm going to ask you a, a looking back question and a looking forward question of sorts. Um, what were some, what are your proudest achievements as a scientist, a scholar, and a citizen? Would you, if you were able to pick three things, what would they be? <laughs> Only three. Wow. I, I don't know. <laughs> you can kind of, kind of spin it a certain way. Yeah. The, the importance of knowing how to educate the public is, 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 has some, still some serious problems. For example, are we hungry? We tell people maybe you shouldn't build your house in this area because it floods every year. Well, the people say, "Well, wait a minute. Why don't you stop the flooding?" <laughs> that's what they say to the other people. Yep. And and that's it's a strange. It's, it's, situation is that we can tell people that they shouldn't do something and or they have a, a naive attitude that somebody's going to pay for it every every year no flooding put on and the, the insurance industry has a lot to put sort a of dictate priorities for how to deal with these situations in the sense that 
uh, uh, and then I don't let you borrow any money out of their insurance. It's, it's going to be funny every year. Our gets first good time. And we, we can give that information to the policymakers, to the public, and we can give it to the insurance companies. And we're doing that. But people still have this idea I don't want to change. I want to keep doing things the way I want to do. And at some point, we have to say no to people. And you can't do certain things. That's happening with climate change issues. Is that uh, we can tell you that putting a, a, a new dock or something like that in the Gulf of Mexico. Sure, you can do it, but you got to build it the right way. Or, or if you have a lot of, of uh, homes that are going to be jeopardized on the on the scientific committee, has to help. Policymakers and people get educated. If they don't do it, you know, we're going to be ending up with more and more people killed. And I think it's a shame. There's enough information to tell us there's things that we should not do. But policymakers will more sometimes and over promise and say, well, we can help you fix it. So it'll never happen again. No, they can't. Yeah, that's a, that's a human problem. That's no longer physics. No. <laughs> <laughs> a tougher problem in certain ways. So what advice would you give your grandchildren about climate change? I would want them to, to be aware and educated about climate change. I think that's the best way to, to, to get things changed. Uh, our schools have a responsibility of, of, of saying what, what we know and don't know. And that's a very, every, every level as they go from from the elementary school to the high school, and so forth. I, I have looked at it mostly in terms of, of, uh, of careers. Uh, I'm not sure that we have, it, have enough forecasters who are knowledgeable, but other fields have a, have a responsibility to be educated, and, and education will get us through a future. That's good. Well, I don't know where we are on time, um, but I I could keep asking questions, certainly, but uh, I'll ask those over dinner. Okay. What I'll do now is say thanks a lot uh, for this time, for your wisdom, uh, for your mentoring. Uh, again, congratulations on this award. I think it's fantastic. Uh, had a fantastic career and inspired a lot of people deeply um, beyond being scientists, being advocates, being advocates, uh, activists, uh, being folks who want to engage the public. Uh, thank you again. Congratulations. Thank you. I can just say one more thing. I think that the, the, the award is timely and and very good. But it, 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 it brings together the, the science, but also the responsibilities of other parts of our society to deal with these problems and come up with 
It's just unfortunate that we, it often takes longer to, to you know, really see the changes. But it's clear that the uh, words like, like, like this one can help stimulate uh, a higher degree of interaction in between society and science. And I wanted to gotten gotten this board because it helps to enforce that improvement of of society and science. Thank you.